land back. I get my land back. I won't get my land black. If form keeps me laid back. Land back. I get my land back. I won't get my land black. If form keeps me laid back. Uno, dos, tres, a mí. Secret in American politics is that most of them mother. Whoa, 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 Prophet, no! Sad, sad, sad. Oh, 
some sad shit. My concerns are not centered on people, but in reflection. I told her people mama, cause the ironic man. tone they take. The if I think the theories of government or the words I mean, and words are sound, the theories are real again. and useless I unless I people me, mama, carry I'm them, great. but useless like and I'm useless over. unless people carry them, attack them, or celebrate them. You're in a booty nigga. You're in a booty nigga. You're coming down. Useless. Just all of it. Useless. With the ideas. Some motherfucking single and deaf. I'm talking about that. Useless. And you know what? Damn well. Each of these days come. My own way of you know they come to us no and to me. Son. I'll do yeah. pretty much what I would have done. Beat of the broken ass clock. Even though people change me. Sometimes bring tell out me. of myself. You ain't been to just tell me when I gain it. I spit in a man's face. I'm a long fucking liar. I'm waking against heavy breathing. He's breathing breath. all night. It's a new light. 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 It's a from God Bunched Nose Deaf You know like Deaf Deaf This bunch Now to hear me Till finally I said That man can't speak His Whoa. voice is gone And the Whoa. tall man Without even looking Wheezed And who the fuck I ask you, ask you What is tomorrow What is tomorrow It is the measure Of my no. dwindling I know I ask I you What is tomorrow That he cannot out come today I ask you I ask you Who 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 Tradition. How you figure? Some never been there. You gotta Where show me. At. Even if sometimes in town and home, like this time. But what I'm saying is, that, that time, I'm from Missouri. both times, show me. They lie. The nice ones, the evil ones, uh -huh. describing the gig elect yeah. as the referee of motherfucking booze. Again, but not another, just like in the them. This time it gotta be we. All of us gotta be in the one. In the upset of the coming setup. Be why, cause you the man and the man now and known. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. How's everybody doing? I say, how's everybody doing? All right, we're going to get started in about a minute. Get everybody situated. Uh, we want to thank everybody for coming out um, to hear uh, our Willow Books office tonight. Um, it's always a treat to see everyone in, in one place. 
Um, Curtis Crystal ladies and gentlemen, just give him a round of applause. Just because he's a cool guy. <laughs> but anyway, um, tonight we have um, we have a we have about ten we have about ten readers. Um, we're going to, and because of because of time, and I don't want to take anyone's time, we're going to try to go through them, you know, systematically. And I'll save the chatter for me for later. But um, there's a couple of things um, we want to definitely thank um, Gamalt Gamalt Gallery, James is it James Patrick, James Patrick and John Robinette for for the video. Yeah, give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. The wine crew back there, I forgot your names. <laughs> All right. And so um, it's actually interesting, I was thinking about it, like each one of these writers that we're going to bring up, um, there's actually some kind of way that we're connected. And that's the way I like the Willows family you know, to be, because um, the, when Heather and I first started out with this mission, you know, this is what we sort of envision. People all, often sort of misunderstand Willow Books and that it's a place for artists to sort of grow. We want to give you that space, man, because we know how hard it is out here. And, um, and that's, 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 that's our main mission, is to, is to do that. And so, um, and some of these writers have been with us, man, like Derek, uh, Curtis, man, you know, from the beginning, you know. And they're going on to do other things, and man, we do, we, all, we do nothing but support them, and we applaud them for what they do, what they go out in the world to do because they represent us, and they always going to be us, right? All right. And then so, first up is is a is a, is a young woman that I met um, when I first started. Actually, you know, we started writing, uh, thinking about doing poetry, trying to figure out what that was and how my my, my how my my, how I fit in this space, right? And so I remember meeting Mahogany years ago, years ago at the um, Bar 13. I think we had a mutual friend in Virginia. If I'm, I, it's, it's, it's not coming. It, we'll, we'll go back to that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's <the> old stuff. <laughs> but anyway, um, she has, she's, our, she's our newest author, one of our newest authors, and she has a book coming out called Redbone. And it's going to be you know, something special, right? And so we're going to bring her up first. I'm going to read you a little bit of a bio. She's got books all over the place. I'm going to read you something. But <laughs> Akavi Khanum and Poets House alumni Mahogany L. Brown is the author of several books, including Dear Twitter, Love Letters, Hashed Out Online, recommended by Small Press Distribution, and About.com's Best Poetry Books of 2010. She has released five LPs, including the live album, Shiroshima, a co-founder of the Off-Broadway Poetry Production Jam on it, and co-producer of NYC's first performance poetry festival, Sound Bites, right? Um, she, huh, I'm, gl nah, I, I'm with you, I'm with you. <laughs> she is Irvin Word, NC Mentor, and seen on HBO's Brave New Voices. Uh, she, she curates at the New York Regan Cafe. She's an all-around dope poet, a good person. I love her to death. Please welcome Mahogany Brown. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited. Um, I'll read from Redbone first, being that Willow, um, I'm really, really appreciative of you um, believing in me. And my mother is also appreciative of you. <laughs> Because it's her story, and I'm very lucky. Um, so this is actually um, uh, Redbone, Shames the Devil, and it's in the voice of my mother. Sometimes you ain't supposed to love up on nobody like that. Sometimes it's too hard on the bones, and only your own self know what you can do with the weight of it all. Only you know what you can take. Everybody told me what to do when it came to bear. Told me let them go. Told me leave them alone. Told me take my kids and pregnant self back down to the valley like there wasn't a man waiting to pull my skin away from my scalp there too. I tell him no. My eyes all heavy from the sleep I ain't got and my back on fire from the baby trying to break free from my spine. I tell him no. We gonna make this family make sense. But what I really want to say is we gonna fall into the night like we fell into each other and it won't hurt no more. Cause I hurt when we ain't together. 
I hurt because it reminds me of my daddy, how he made my mama cry, how her tears carry me to sleep on nights I forgot to close the door. When we ain't together, I'm reminded that I'm broken, that my heart ain't got no locks because it ain't got no doors. Because they took away my doors when I was only a baby. Hell, don't nobody want to hear about a baby girl at the missing door. Shit, that sound too much like blame. And I'm tired of how my fingers bend. And all I want is for some reason to stay put. All I want is for something that stays mine. My first husband got a mean space between his chest. He took my first and second born out of spite. He a spiteful man. They grew in my belly. Burned my heart with pride. Crushed my smile into pieces when they cried. They was mine. He was never mine. He showed me that truth after he ran around town in love with the newer and younger me. My big old belly was just reason enough for him to cheat the first time. So by the time I got me a man who make me feel like I got doors on my everything, like I got a key, like I control the movement in my body, I ain't care too much that he cheat too. My first husband got me used to a bed smelling like things that wasn't mine. Got so used to it by the time I met Bam, I was happy someone wanted to fight for me. I was happy even if the only person he fought was me. Every bruise and throat clinch, every push we created into the mattress spread through my body warm, glow, bright, it matched my hair and the, the gap in my teeth and it keep him coming back, telling me sweet things now. I don't start no mess, but I'm not running to the valley neither. Besides, he say he gonna fight the world for what's his. I am his, and he is mine, and we got this baby too. You can't tell me that ain't love. You can tell me anything but that. And so Redbone is all this, you know, just an investigation um, of my parents in love, how they came to be, and I never saw them together or in love. Um, so it was a lot of interviewing of my family and getting people drunk. <laughs> you know, you got, that's how you get the truth, huh? Um, but now I'm going to read from Smudge, which is, uh, it was the first thing I started writing after the Redbone series, which was necessary because you know how you write a series and then afterwards you're like, well, I'm going to still write about my mama. I'm off it. Like, come on. <laughs> I need a minute. I'm going to breathe. So Smudge is all about black girl, uh, coming of age, silence, shadows, sex. I want to tell you a story. It goes like this. The girl with slit for eyes and tight mouth sneaks her high school dropout boyfriend into the house while the adults sleep noisily. You have a new sliver of admiration for her, something about the green chipped paint stain in the seat of her jeans or the broken garage door open like a panting dog. Something about her bravado urging you to peek in the room and listen as your cousin recounts the night, the honorable evening. A less ambitious high school dream, because you are still in middle school, so your stomach is already hot with giggles, because no one says slut. Not like the time the new girl from Los Angeles moved into your neighborhood. Her first week smelled like a Sweet Valley High chapter, except she is nothing like Jessica. No blue eyes, no blonde hair, nothing except her girl shape and her dangerous eyes, and she is everything like you, except the boys like her, and not when no one is looking. And every day, everyone is looking. Her acid-washed jeans announce she is not from here. She is different. You think you could want to be this type of different. You think you could want this type of different holding your name. And after, ap and after school, everyone walks home by the swallow of oak trees near the quiet bend and soccer post furthest from the park. And you want to follow the crowd to sit beneath the shade, but you have chores. But you have not been remembered yet. An acid wash jeans girls is not your friend yet. So you have no real reason to pretend you belong and the next day you try not to be surprised. Your mouth is silent. Oh, when you return, the new girl with acid wash jeans is no longer shiny, no longer new. Just another brown girl gone black and unwanted and almost closer to you and her name is a bone in their mouths. All cause her acid wash jeans were caught around her ankles at the park with one of the loudest of swaggers, he claim the prize. He raise his hands, he say with the barrage of snarl, she stink, she nasty, she let me. And after school, no one is walking with her, no one is following her unless to laugh and her and laugh at her and call her fish girl and call her anything but her name. Thank you. 
And I'm going to close with this poem. I was so happy that um, I was able to put it in Redbone because I've been doing it for years. And um, thanks for having me. And thank you for being here. Thanks for writing books. You know what I'm saying? Shit's an art. It's a dying art. I still steal books. <laughs> Be careful. I see you. <laughs> They're expensive. It's expensive hobby. <laughs> you okay with that? I'm going to steal your shit, Randall. I'm playing. <laughs> this kin, this stone toss family, this kin, this death of choice, this choice of addiction, this kin addicted to dying, this black death that smells like home, this home, this heart has no home, this heart left a home in California, this heart found a home in Brooklyn, in airports, in a little girl's eyes, in the halo of gentrification. And a little bit better, it will all be better if I could just have this home, this house, this man that I love, this love I can't hold, this man that I need, this life I can't hold, this want, this now, this here, sprawled inside my chest, this black that I can't separate from the breaking sunrise of this smile, this root of all evil, this woman, this evil, this woman, this God, this evil to think myself evil, this God, this evil to think myself anything less than woman, this Bermuda, this Stonehenge, this temple, this flesh, and this fat, this sister, this lover, this wife, yes, this motherfucking wife, this here, be more than your jump off, be more than your free milk, this be your mother's lonely, this black girl, this bricklayer, this woman that can't forget how to kiss like shadows, how to smile like Kripke Purse, how to Pray like a whisper, how to forget where she came from, where she came from, from a gutter of a woman and a jawbreaker of a man. This hammerhead love sits on my chest, this crunch, this crush, this sound of breakable things, this worthless thing, this worthwhile thing, this breath is worthwhile. This hurt is worth now. This now is worth tomorrow. This tomorrow ain't even here yet, but it sound good. Sound like spilled 40 ounces and split click flips. This concrete crack tomorrow. This glass chip tomorrow. This morning song of good. This Billie Holiday heartbreak good. This Nina Simone feel good. Tomorrow's full of good and heart clatter. And it sound like love. This love. This harbor. This boat. This water. This love. This faith. This cliff. This die. This miss and dive again still this love that loves so much more than love this girl that loves a love like this the center smile this blade rebirth this jackknife heart this pulse with the face like our own this bloody pulp this this thank you Can we give another round of applause for Mahogany Brown? Something special, right? All right. Every time I hear Mom, I'm like, I ain't scared of you motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing it. Oh my. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for starting off, baby girl. Thank you for starting off. All right. Uh, next up, next up is Adrian Christian. <laughs> All right. Adrian Christian is a Kavi Khanum Fellow and a member of the Carolina African American Writers Collective. Uh, her poetry and prose has appeared in Today's Black Woman, Jolie Obsidian, to name a few. She is a recipient of the University of Michigan African American Alumni Council Five under the 10 Young Alumni Recognition Award. <laughs> That was a lot. <laughs> she's from she's from Detroit, um, and she has a, a chat book, 12023 Woodman Avenue. All right, let's bring her up. Miss Adrian Christian. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, to understand a lot of my poetry, you have to see how it's laid out on the page. So that's why you guys all have copies, so that you can follow along with me. And uh, feel free to keep these after I'm done, okay? I figured I'd um, depress all of you with some poems about my, 
some poems about my childhood. <laughs> Welcome. Okay, this first one is called Dog in a Dead Man's House. I was a dog in a dead man's house. I was a tooth in a dead man's mouth. I was a rat in the family's den. I was a hog in a horse's pen. She spoke to me when she wasn't pissed off. She got pissed off when she looked at my face. I got my freckles and nose from my dad. He was a man set on being a rat. She was a girl with her head in her hands. She was a girl who just couldn't make ends. Meet up with no support check from my dad. I was the curse of the blood with no pad. She said, your dad needs to take care of you. He needs to feed you and buy you new shoes. He's got to learn to provide for his kids. I ate the roaches I found in the fridge. Pimped or pawn. She made me a hooker when she made me babysit his boys six and three on Saturdays. She made certain I stayed well into Sunday morning. She made dollars off her daughter. She made no mention of the gifts I received. Too extravagant for boys. She made me wear something sexy. Quit dressing like a boy. She made sure to choose someone blackmailable. He made me vodka and cranberry to wash him down with. He made me come like that, snap your middle and thumb. He made me good in bed. I learned what big boys like, cramming all those Saturday nights. I made my girlfriends want to be me with my new fat titties. I made fun of their double A's and their hymens intact. He and I even joked about that. After a while, she made her move. She made him miss work to talk to her. She had a set of balls, that bitch. She had three girls, why the middle one? She made dollars off her daughter. She probably paid the phone bill so she could talk more men into busting nuts into her baby girl's mouth. God, I hate that whore, but I digress. Anyway, she had a set of balls, that woman. That and a beautiful daughter had. The bathtub made me do it. I could take the bitch and the hoe or whore and the ponytail pulling and the coming to my school and kicking my ass in class and the ain't I just as fine as she is? She. When I was her age, I ran circles around her ass. The I wish I never had you motherfuckers. The non-existent trip to the doctor, to the dentist. The bologna sandwiches while, we, while she ate Wendy's while we watched. The absolutely not to any fucking thing we even thought about asking her for. The birthday money she took. The friend's father she took. The having kids was the worst thing that ever happened to me speech. The for the nine months I carried you growing inside me song and dance. The way my perfect grades and invitation to attend private school were met with. Yeah, okay, bring mama my cigarettes and a lighter and an ashtray. But it was when she would bathe and make me clean out her filth afterwards. That made my sister and I set our house on fire one Wednesday night. <laughs> one more. <laughs> so you guys know the poet Marvin Bell? He was one of my teachers in grad school and I talked to him about my story and he said, Adrian, you have to um, picture Sisyphus happy. You guys know Sisyphus, the guy from, um, okay. So um, <laughs> this is, <laughs> <laughs> so this poem is called How I Got Over for Marvin Bell. <laughs> I imagine Sisyphus happy. That great big boulder would give me beautiful shoulders. That steepest of hills would give me gorgeous calves. The onlookers at the bottom of the hill, I could crush them. I imagined Sisyphus happy. <laughs> Thank you, guys.
round of applause. Thank you, Adrian. Yay! And now, Adrian was uh, uh, one of our emergence and poets, on our, and she, her, 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 chap, her book appeared on that chapbook series as an emergent poet. And so it's, I think it's fitting to bring up our next uh, writer, um, a person I've known for a while, and I know has a lot, a lot of talent, and um, I'm just really happy that she, you know, has this book out right now. So um, it's called Automation. Automation. Yeah, damn. <laughs> Too much wine. <laughs> there you go. All right. April Gibson is a poet and essays. Her work has appeared in Pluck, Nagatok River, As Us, title based on review, Literary Mama, and elsewhere. She holds an MFA in creative writing from Chicago State University. April was selected for the Loft Literary Center's 2014 Mentor Series Award in Poetry. She resides in the Twin Cities with her two sons, though Chicago is where her heart lives. <laughs> Come on, Chicago. Happy to be here, everybody. I'm really excited, and I'm gonna jump into this. I'm really excited to be um, a part of um, Willow Loops, and I do admire all of the the people um, that I get to work with and um, be with. So um, this this book, Automation, uh, I want to say is like the the origin or creation story uh, of my son and a love story um, in some kind of way. Hopefully that's what you take away from me. <coughs> Telecon energy. Clockwise, her wrist flips, dead chicken splatters across the iron rust. An arson of pig meat swells the air. Bad lungs hold the phone and gossip and prayer. Sit your bones, child. On the step letter, the green velour gold push pin chairs. Let the kitchen comb bite between the kink, be clinked, greased, and quiet at the cross. Bass tenor acapella magic in the mauve pew, pools of holy spun instruction. Move your bones, child. Erupt cadence beneath a proper curtsy. Gait and to antiquity be a ballooning stride of ruffle and lace. The draping of broods. Drift. Each night I dream of the first night. I surrendered my swelling body into the corner of a back seat. Passing tolls, street lights, headlights, I fell asleep as my parents bickered in the front seat into the light of day. Even in the dream, this place cannot be real. It is a book I read, a television program, a set. All white, small town, anywhere, America. I should have hitched, stole a car, but I was too stupid to know my way back. I had lost the battle, I was a loser, was less than all the terribleness I had been before that day. I accepted my fate, and with no vigor, ascended the narrow staircase to the second floor. Alone, with a tote and two old suitcases, they left me stranded in a strange land. Surrounded. I think the bed has plastic over the mattress, not sure but it is small and uncomfortable. There are three rooms and at first six girls. They put me with the other black girl in a small room, left side of the hall, chilly at night with the smallest closet, not as bright as the other two rooms. The sun hides from this side of a hospital, this side of a house that used to be a hospital. I read that somewhere in a brochure. 
There are alarms on our windows as if stick figures harboring humanity will esca escape wreck tangles and scale the brick. Using a pair of those cheap donated sheets, or maybe we will sew all the towels together, unraveling their obediently folded positions, rolled the same each time, no creases showing on top, except we cannot sew, cook, clean, do anything deemed good and right. We can only be dishonored girl bodies, hostage in a second floor haven funded by the good Lord and his saints where we make goulash and buckeyes, hot dishes from scratch. Activities include grocery shopping, special functions at the local church, arriving in a 13 passenger van like a small band of scarlet whores with Madam Missionary at our side. We make phone calls on weekends, all mail is pre-screened, our love letters tossed away, live visits rare and watched closely, Twice in 120 days, my family remembers I am not home. They stayed for dinner. They took a photo. I wore my hair back. The littlest brother touched my swelling belly. They drove off. Left me once again with the midwife minister, mad woman, mother hen beneath us, listening, checking for swiftness in 12 steps. She is with us on two when the first baby dies. When we watch the other black girls struggle down the poorly lit corridor, crawling walls while the God that is a man throws bricks inside her. He rushes, then calms the bloodletting, and the pink matter begins to unswim his mother. She thinks he was a boy. So we say he had her long feet, though really it has no feet at all, just webs with tiny slits, but if we squint, we tell her we can see a toe. Birthing a dying thing is like cutting your hair before it grows, digging flat follicles with blades, razoring roots, and frantic part and peel. She wants to grow wings and rocket through the drop ceiling, crack the thick glass, set a four alarm frenzy, make a cape of thin thread, stitch an S in deep red proudly across her breast filled with unusable milk, stiffening across her heart that has learned the world too wide, too soon. She swings her skinny brown arms at the air, feet still on the ground, she fights to peel back the sky as the mad woman drapes her buckling body in a bed sheet. Domesticated. On the first floor, I live in my mother's bed for six weeks. She helps me learn quickly. The blanket wrap, diamond, angle, angle, tip, tuck, pull tight. To use the soft side of a wrist to grease the dry splits in a breast. She takes Polaroids of a pose on repeat. Her words like parallelograms in blue ink scripting blank white into memory, each smile. 1,000 elegies. Every tomorrow, yesterday's rerun, warm bottles, their nipples, my nipples, milk, and a stranger's vomit. Shit in tight knot plastic bags. I am a machine girl. Wiping gently the face, patting softly the back, feeding God's poked hole in the night. A weeping ball of tissue, a pale crusting flake of new, with nail beds traced in brown half moons, fingers clawing themselves to fist, oils between my hands and his, nothing on the inside. Thank you. Can we get another round of applause for April Gibson, <laughs> Chicago's finest? Thank you, April. Really appreciate it. And you know, it's, it's, it's writers like April and Adrian that sort of help foundation windows and sort of 
you know, that, that mission of sort of giving, op giving writers a chance. So we appreciate you both. I want you to know that. Thank you. And so with that said, our next, our next poet coming up is an old head, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> started while he started out with us from the beginning. And a lot of people don't necessarily really understand how, you know, the, the genesis of Willow Books and, you know, it just started between the email between two people and wanting to see something better than what we were seeing out there in the world. That was just it. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, you talk about what you're going to do, but then you have to do it. And so we just stopped, got, we just stopped talking and we just started trying to do something. And, you know, it's just sort of always good to see, you know, each year, you know, sort of putting blocks in place to sort of cement that in some kind of way. But it doesn't happen without the writers and, you know, the writers and you guys do the work. So we definitely thank you. With that said, we want to thank Derek Harrell too. Uh, my man, um, who started with us from the beginning, Cotton, Ropes, um, he's, um, he's coming, he has a new book coming out with uh, Louisiana State University Press. What's the name of it again? The Stripper in Wonderland. But then, huh? Oh, that's right. Oh, it's a book of I know. <laughs> All that in the bag of chips. But anyway, uh, we have a, a special treat. We got Derek coming up. Um, I've been knowing Derek for a long time since since our MFA program. We've we've not seen him, you know, from the beginning. He's we've seen each other grow and try to negotiate this landscape, this literary landscape, and try to find a way and make a way out of sometimes no way. So I really respect him for what he does, man. And so it was just a mutual respect from the beginning. So um, we want to thank him for being with us and wish him well what he does. And but he knows he knows what home is too. So <laughs> so Derek is an assistant professor in English and Afro American Studies at the University of Mississippi. His poems have been published in numerous journals and in anthologies. Uh, Cotton was his first collection of poems. Please welcome Derek Harrell. Hey, I'm going to read some poems. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, Heather, thank you for your commitment to poetry and underrepresented poetry. I feel like lately I've been maybe a grouch, a poetry grouch. <laughs> so I'm happy that we have spaces like this with um, things that feel pure to me. Um, so I'm going to read a couple poems. I, I normally don't read poems that I've never read. So I might fuck up, and if I do, um, I apologize in advance. But I've never read these poems. They're out of the new collection, uh, Stripper in Wonderland. So this is um, interview, interview to Taxi to Airport. Who are your influences? Don't ask me about influences. Who not who you probably think who is are not who you know for example who is nappy headed tenement king inside leather cabin making us matter brief moment collective dream gatherers punching shoulders debating who whose future car it is but better when who gets out and eyes my 100 pound body down says something like not exactly this but something like little man you want to run with me hell yeah who Run these courts, king. Run whatever you think I'm capable of running. Because when who passes the ball and that shot makes, who's do that shit, little man. Approval makes me matter. When who says I put my money on little man against any motherfucker out here makes me believe words alter worlds. Rip me off, driver man. All the money I never made. Yours today. The negotiating about my worth resources, budget cuts, unsupportive deans and such led me to shower this city uncompensated. Not your fault, driver man, but you love to talk. Not known for strip clubs. Go to Atlanta, you'll thank me, American. I'm flying American, big bearded black American flying man. Got kids to feed, you got kids, then you know the endless nature of their appetite. Right here works what I owe for this ride. The chatter, take this change. Cop shorty some candy from a baby fiending stranger.
the investment banker stumbles into a Vegas strip club. Pumped on too many mollies, too many deadlines, too many known blown, nose blown superlatives. Salute the morals, integrity, the hedge funds, the benefits, beneficiaries, bonds, blondes, adorn Vegas boys. We all die ugly in empty caskets. We all die and sign off souls to men, women, children we barely know. Take what's reaped, what Harvard, Wall Street afforded you, Grim Reaper, Candyland Alexander, Vanguisher, and Ventriloquist. You got this. It's yours, like the Ackerman deal. Yours, like the wretched tie, lights you, a tear below, rappers, atmospheres above, teachers, your hand raised, trophy clench, gray goose, glows, Beyonce belly like, platinum rapper like, you know all the words, all the words, all the worlds backdrop this pageant, and beauty bangs your brain, pulsar, like that time, you stumble out of your last one. The rapper leans into an Atlanta strip club. The book is called Stripper in Wonderland. Go figure. The rapper leans into an Atlanta strip club. Bright ghetto royalty adorned and bright ghetto manifestation this urn. Nine to five like time and a half like time flutters. A G-string flutters. American coot caught in a carnival, carnival of bass of fumes, of plants, and planets, and wet, and consumption. My man shooting a red pill tonight. He's shooting a red pill off a brown belly. He's shooting a red pill off a brown belly, unfamiliar. Outside, Midtown spreads its mouth, not yawn-like, gator-like. Ironically, our guy once blew a gator's head off in Macon. He swears. He's whispering the story to the ear of an unfamiliar being. Diamond, right now, he's rapping how he stalked. The reptile, how he braved. The bugs, the mud, the shrubs. How for nights he heard the animal wheeze beneath his bed. How it's wet, scales prompted wet. Dreams of swamp and sweat and sweet and beets. Bounds, wet. It's the last one. Um, I live in Mississippi now. So um, this is called All Strippers Reincarnate to Mississippi. <laughs> Christ resurrected tailors and Chelsea's chew bubblegum beneath Bible red kissers blow Andrew and Brandon and Taylor, country kissers yoked in red purple, clay colored bruised weathered cowgirl boots, line dance in a pickup trucks, holy spotlight. Them all country soundtrack matter girls with Vegas and Hollywood deja vu memories. Whenever she circles, seduces country boys, belt buckle proud, Country speckled Saturday, yeehaw, whiskey hour bonfire gives pulse to a county otherwise forgotten. Otherwise engine and smoke and jean and leather. Otherwise rubber and whiskey and seersucker and cigar. What to do when Madison starlights the line, ghetto ash drops Jackson's simmered lap. She will, and all of Mississippi will moon land in hand clap, high five, handshake, cat call, celebrate her for their own private deja vu, reminder of soulful opulence, of Louis and Beamer and Cartier and Dolce, and she'll Christian red bottom her way out those boots into a bar of ghetto, music and ghetto, dancing. She'll wake daddy from a ghetto nightmare where his baby shuts down a Jackson bar where she screams, I'm a bad bitch to a Confederate moon at 11.59, the desperate hour, she raises whiskey rosé-like, swallows the wealthy fingers that decorate her by the motherfucking county. Thank you. Another round of applause for Derek. And just to be, just to be sure, just a little promotion, we have Mahogany's book, Smudge, April's book, Automation, Adrian, 12023 Woodmont Avenue, 
ropes. One other thing I wanted to um, just uh, announce briefly, um, Nicole Martinez is in the house, and I just wanted to um, give her a shout out because she was, um, her, her, her book was selected during our um, Editor's of Choice select open reading period um, with Summers of Cicadas, and um, I just wanted to not publicly acknowledge that. It's one of the, probably one of the most, most interesting books I've read of fiction in a long time, and that's saying a lot. <laughs> no, for real. So, you know, you take it how you want to, but I let you be the judge of that, but it's coming out uh, next year. So I just wanted to, you know, put that in. Ah, so next up, Imaginary Animal. Rochelle Linda Escamilla, come on up. <laughs> She is from Hollister, California. 20, in 2014, she returned from China, where she co-founded co Sun Yat-sen University's English Language Center for Creative Writing. She is also the founder of the Poets and Writers Coalition at San Jose State University, Push Poetry, and the El Pazote Reading Series. She's back in her hometown organizing anything that has to do with poetry. Come on over, Cheryl. <laughs> The grand prize winner for poetry. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. I think my mom's watching in Hollister, so hey, mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I got the news that I won this when I was in China, and it was the, the thing that made me decide to come back. Um, from China. I mean, there was a lot of things about China that made me want to come back, but <laughs> that was <laughs> the solidifying factor. Um, I never thought I never thought these poems would get published just because they kept getting rejected um, over and over again, and I was just you know they wouldn't fit in everyone else's stuff because everyone else doesn't fit with me, you know. So, all right. An extension of your arm or moments when need is greater than or equal to our involvement in the struggle. She tells you she has forgotten why she moved to Pittsburgh and when she's home she watches workers careworn. She extends her arm out the window, her palm a platform for the flashing rows of produce. Give us your arm, they said, and like the artichoke we pull away from a center. She tells you how they carted them here, trucked them, she corrects herself, on the backs of flatbeds freshly deloused. She's forgotten why she moved to Pittsburgh and when she's home, she watches workers, careworn, extends her arm out the car window, holding her palm a platform for the flashing rows of produce. An extension of your arm or decisions made by the United States to allow us into our own land. The canneries in town toss skins of tomatoes into backs of large semi-truck haulers. We get to get to the WIC office, we walk under the slides tasting acid at the back throat and watch red stains spread into her, the thick of her tan sweater. She tells her, pick up the pace. She knows the importance of preservation of a sweater that lasts more than a season. She thinks of the cans of tomato sauce, the lids shiny in the trash, her mother's sopa, sopa de fideo. Consider for a moment the weight of, the financial burden of, such a heavy nose on a flat-faced people. We have mulled over the potential gains, hand-picked barrios containing short, coffee, mud-colored children, we have calculated the cost of, and we cannot apologize for, Operation Wetback, circa 1954. She tells you that she has forgotten why she moved to Pittsburgh to begin with. She has a general feeling of discomfort, a lack of cultural influence. She has, is having trouble accentuating the correct syllables when ordering enchiladas. She extends her arm out the moving car, you can see the indentation of the window bend in her upper arm. You know her hands are rough with calluses. You know she isn't tougher than she imagines. She opens her palm to the passing field, the mountains scraping her fingertips. 
she imagines oxen, big, bulky, brown bodies, taping hoods to neck. One, position the lip below the navel, pull the paring knife down the dress, slip the thumb and spread the flesh, gut the belly, take the seed, set them side by side to dry in the sun. Direct your attention to the artichoke, artichoke plants, the ones that look like large scarecrow, dark against the shade of the mountain range. They look like people. Well, she corrects herself, they almost look like people. She tells you about that term wetback, how it means they cross the border at the river. She smiles when she says it, you know she loves the water. so much thank you so much um, yeah and anytime Patrick was all is in love with it I, I'm in love with it too <laughs> <laughs> next up um, we have Brian Gilmore who is kind yeah man he's, he's not actually on our press right now but he's like a friend and some other things too <laughs> But all around, he just, he's just, he's Willow too. So, I mean, he's family. So, he, and plus, he's published by Cherry Castle, which is uh, run by my man True Thomas, you know, and so nothing but respect for that. Uh, Brian Gilmore is the author of two previous collections of poetry. Elvis Presley is alive and well and living in Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that alone, you know. <laughs> and Jungle Nights and Soda Found Rags. Poems for Duke Ellington, a winner of the Maryland State Arts Council Individual Artist Award, Kavi Conham and Kimberly O'Fellow. He teaches law at the Michigan State University College of Law. That's right. <laughs> Dividing his time between Michigan and his beloved birth birthplace, Washington, D.C. Come on up, Slim. <laughs> Thank you for those poets who read already. Fabulous, fabulous poetry. Thanks for the space and, of course, family, heaven. They've always been there for me, I can tell you that. They're good people. My book is, if you didn't know, any gangsters, Cherry Castle Tale. This is called, uh, there's a couple of trilogies in the book, and this one is from the trilogy called Watermelon Man. This is number two. My brothers and I watch a movie called Watermelon Man. It is a stupid movie. <laughs> no one turns black by sitting under a sun lamp and eating soy sauce. And no one ever told me not to sit on the back of the bus or that security guards might follow me in stores. I used to look at pictures of young Elizabeth Taylor and I thought she was gorgeous. I saw Natalie Wood stripped half naked in gypsy and was in love with her forever. <laughs> Elvis Presley movies never bothered me at all, especially Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> My mother made the best spaghetti sauce I have ever tasted. She has never been to Italy. <laughs> My father read Rousseau and Martin Luther. My sister liked the Beatles. My grandmother was born on a plantation in Texas. My other grandmother picked cotton down south all day until her hands swelled up and bled. She didn't keep any of the money she earned. She always kept Confederate dollars tacked to the wall in her home. She gets a pension check today from changing linen all day for 30 years at downtown hotels. She bakes biscuits and pies as if she is still surrounded by farms as if she could wake each morning in the dark of dawn to get her own milk and eggs. I still watch Watermelon Man every year. It is still an awfully stupid movie. <laughs> Security guards follow me in stores. Even now, sometimes I stop and ask them, don't you think Natalie Wood 
was beautiful and gypsy. <laughs> Another trilogy in there is the uh, called the George Holiday Rodney King video, and it's a three-part poems. And uh, I'm gonna read the first two parts. The first part is subtitled "Edited for Television." And the second part is called Director's Cut. This was George Holiday was the famous plumber who cut on the tape that day a long time ago. Y'all know that's the story about that. George Holiday, Rodney King video. Roxanne, world is running down. One world is enough. Enough. Driven to tears, driven to tears. Bombs away, one world, one world, can't stand, can't stand, world is running down, voices, voices, tears, can't stand, too much information, one world, one world, so lonely, too much, so lonely, too much information, bombs, bombs, tears, tears, every little, every little, voices, voices, world running down, driven to tears, voices, bombs, bring on the, bring on the bombs, voices, Bombs, voices, tears, bombs, one world, voices, bombs, one world, one world, voices, too much, too much, truth hits, truth hits, bombs, send it out, send it out, bombs, truth, voices, tears, can't stand bombs, truth, voices, every breath, every breath, bombs, SOS, SOS, bombs, bombs, tears. Tears, Roxanne, director's cut. Dred Scott, Martin King, Rodney King, Dred King, Martin Luther Scott, Dred Luther Rodney, Rodney Luther King. The Reverend Dr. Rodney Luther King was pulled over last night by the Los Angeles police in Memphis, Tennessee, and taken to the Lorraine Motel. He escaped. Got a few blocks down the street, but he was caught and brought back to the motel. They asked him, where did he work? He said he hadn't had a job in quite a while. Now and then he preached sermons. They told him he was lying. Dred Scott, Martin Scott, Martin King, King Martin, King Rodney, King Dred, the King of Dred, the Reverend King Scott Martin Dred is a liar. He was free. He was on the balcony. He was unarmed. He was a minister. He was probably drunk. He was driving drunk. He was resisting. He was a resister. He had been to the mountaintop. He was a man of peace. He wanted to march Los Angeles, Missouri, Memphis. He had seen Wisconsin, the promised land, the court settlement, Rodney Martin Dredd King Scott King, a drunken liar, a man with no real job, driving skills, a man who preaches an occasional sermon, almost died a slave on some balcony in Los Angeles, surrounded by cops with stun guns, batons, explanations, Supreme Court orders, caught on film by Francis Ford, Steven Spielberg, Soderberg, Coppola, Orson, Frank Wells, Capra. That is exactly <laughs> how it happened. <laughs> I watched it without any buttered popcorn. <laughs> Some loud, drunken minister resisting arrest in the 20th century. A war will be fought over a movie. Chances are by Johnny Matheson is the theme song. Oh. <laughs> I'm just read one last point. As you probably know, most writers just, the writing happens when it happens and then they move on trying to do something else. So this is called Raisin in the Sun, and it was published in the Delaware Poetry Review. Started writing these poems like, what does Obama be thinking about <laughs> when he hears all them terrible things they say? You know? This is called Raisin in the Sun. I wasn't born in America. I was born in Hawaii. <laughs> I am not really black. I didn't grow up around black people. I can't make sweet potato pie. <laughs> I can't fry chicken. I can play basketball, but I don't have a crossover. <laughs> I never read Jet or Ebony growing up. I never saw Soul Train or Sanford and Son either. 
Good Times is a disco song by Sheik. But I never knew who Sheik was either. <laughs> Rumor is I dropped acid. Listening to the Eagles mostly. Hotel California. And Kiss painting my face white with stars. I rode a skateboard. I read Stephen King, not James Baldwin or Richard Wright. Martha's Vineyard, is that George Washington's old lady? <laughs> the Underground Railroad was really underground. <laughs> Dred Scott's a Rasta, right? <laughs> Shut the hell up. My father left me. Went back home like he was Marcus Garvey or Du Bois or Carl Hansberry going to Mexico. He was from Chicago. He believed in it. Didn't want to eat his pulled pork on the south side only. They hit his daughter with a brick. Broke his heart. Now we got to hear about it a few hundred times a year. Walter Younger. Walter Younger. Walter Younger. God dang. I wasn't born in America, but I live there now. People there hate me because I am black. Because I don't have a crossover and can't fry chicken. But mostly because I never come out anymore. I stay home, read essays by James Baldwin, fiction by Richard Wright, watch Raisin in the Sun till my hair turns black. If you feel like I do, give him another round of applause. <laughs> I'm just saying. You see why he a friend, right? <laughs> you gotta have friends like that. Keep it real. All right. Um, the next, um, the next poet we have up is Elmas Abinader, and say yay, yay. Um, definitely, I love this book. I was definitely, you know, I, I remember when, when I called and told her about it. Um, I, after I read this book, I was like, oh my God, I, I really love this book, and it was really great to talk to you about it. And I'm glad you, you know, accepted and allowed us to publish this book. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, Elmaz is the author of a memoir, a uh, poetry collection. She has written and performed several one woman plays. Uh, country of Origin, Ramadan Moon, to name a few. Winner of a Goldies in Literature, a Penn Josephine Miles Award. Elmaz has been a Fulbright Scholar and the winner of the Oregon Grammys for Country of Origin. She teaches at Mills College in Oakland, and here's what I love most is the co-founder of Vona Voices. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Come on up, baby. Come on up. Thank you so much. So that last little piece about being the founder of Ona Voices, Heather and Randall, I know what it's like to kill yourself for a dream. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, But I do want to talk to you about the line I put me after Brian. <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess I'm kind of cold about that. <laughs> but I do want to hire Brian to title everything for me. <laughs> it's too good. Um, the title poem is This House of My Bones. And I, I, I try not to read it a lot because it's the oldest poem, but with the assassination of the students in Kenya last week, the, this poem, poem comes back to me. There are a lot of things like that that happen we don't know about. And there are a lot of things that the empire does and other, other arms of resistance do, and we don't understand them. And the poem, This House of My Bones, I don't, some of you are young or old enough to remember back in 2003 when Bush was saying, we're going to come and get you in a month if you don't give us those weapons of mass destruction. Then we're going to do it three weeks. There was like this kind of massive, horrible countdown uh, to um, invading Iraq. And so the, I was in Spain at the time, and it was kind of daunting because I had a reading, and there were millions of Spaniards in the street protesting and boycotting my reading because I was American. And it was really hard to understand because um, I'm Arab. But um, so this House by Bones is, a, is a, an invitation to invaders to actually go meet the people they're going to invade, to go to their houses. And that goes for everybody who wants to kill anybody. 
right? This house, my bones. We are here now. Sit. Sit at the table. Take the tea. Hold the glass warm against your palms. You follow Fuad, the young son. He shows you his room, a drawing he has made of a horse. On his walls, unicorns and dinosaurs. You touch his shoulder, stroke his hair, tell him you are not afraid of extinction. You want to cover his eyes, not have him look toward the sea, flattened by metal swollen smoke. In the mosque, you admire the arches inlaid lapis and ivory sheen of water. Follow the carpets, long runners of miracles and thread. Spines of men curl into the echoes of the muzia. You want to worship like them, the quiet echo of prayer filling the cage of your chest. Two, we are waiting. What do we do in the face of these bombings? Do we gather our jewelry and books? Do we send our children across the border to live in refugee camps? What do we pack? The coffee urn bro father brought from Turkey? The pair of earrings specially chosen for the wedding day? What will become of the tick on the wall marking the child's growth? The groan of the washing machine? The bare spot on the rug where Jiddi put his feet when he read the Friday paper? Three, fear is an uprising rattling against the incarceration of will. Time to leave. You think the history writes you out of this ruined civilization? You don't know, except for the wine-colored thread woven in your hair, the shard of cobalt needle to awakening, and the chambers of your heart weakening. That's a good response. <laughs> take you a little further into depression. <laughs> I'm only going to read three poems, but um, I'm reading ones deliberately about um, my intersections with, you know, trauma in the Middle East. I've spent a lot of time in Ramallah and in Palestine and 13 different Arab countries. And so um, I watched my friends and myself go through some pretty amazing um, uh, insults to humanity, let's just put it that way. That, that would be accurate, right? Everybody thinks that's accurate? Okay. Actually, this is going to be the last poem I read as soon as I find it. Okay, so this, that's okay, right? Two is okay? Okay. Um, this poem is, <laughs> is about maps. I, I like maps. You like maps? Like paper maps? Like the kind where you, like, lose your place and, it, and then the fold's all wrong and then the fold's right on the thing and it rips right where you want to see the, <laughs> the thing you need to see and you kind of fold it and then it's all like origami and... <laughs> all right. And the poem starts in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. I grew up in Appalachia. <laughs> Try to picture that. <laughs> um, and it ends in Palestine. It's called Climb Up and Over. Our garden bordered an alley which crossed into a hayfield and stretched to a hillside. Our yard had lilacs surrounded by a pond filled with sweet peas and crested by vines. Our porch led to a street that lined the road running from our house all the way to West Virginia. And we walked from our house to Neff Woods, from another to a waterfall across the bridge. The coal mining corner of Pennsylvania with all its faults let cows chew from this neighbor to the next. And children crossed yards that were not theirs to get to school and sit on steps of someone's porch without asking permission. And we didn't know that this was belonging. This was Pennsylvania. And not Abu Dis, where a wall was erected right down Main Street, keeping the kids away from the school they'd been going to their whole lives. So what do they do? Like the farmers of Azun, whose vegetable trees, all of groves are out of reach, who stare at the 25 feet of stone and wire 
guarding them from their own food as a security measure that forces a four kilometer walk to get into a gate that gives them 20 minutes to slip over to the other side for bushels of barley to take home if it's still there. Or if you live in the Anata district in East Jerusalem, it's probably not. Some things had to move to make room for the wall and without your home, everyone is more secure. The landscape is sliced and lands are carved and contained. I have studied maps. The blue waters, green mountains, yellow countries, and red ones all meant something to the cartographers, and I followed them. Puzzles of color explained in the legend in the corner that said, this is the earth. Lakes, mountains, cliffs, buttes, highways, hiking trails, one-way streets, capitals, borders, mileage counters, oceans, rivers snaking through states and countries, ranges creaking across the Urals, frozen tundra, pampas, belt, thickly populated cities, railroad tracks. I run my finger along each symbol, each road designation, each color, each touchstone. How do you mark a barrier? Make it part of a landscape. What is the symbol of restraint, the color of confinement, disruption, loss and separation, of sorrow? How do you hold that pen, diagram the atlas, sketch the captivity? This is not the wall of the great march to liberation, just a slow death to the earth that inhabits it and the people who call it home. Thank you. It's funny, people always ask me a lot of times what I'm reading, when I'm reading a lot of Willow's office because I see, I see all of the manuscripts and so, it's the education within itself sometimes, so I feel lucky for that, so thank you guys. We got three more people, I need you to bear with me for a few more minutes, we're gonna get you out of here, but we got three more people you need to hear. <laughs> Begin <laughs> <laughs> Beginning with Angela Narcisco Torres, um, um, who won the Willow Books Literature Awards Grand Prize for Poetry a couple years ago, um, and she's actually one of you know a very hard worker, and she's all all, all, all over the place all the time, um, <laughs> doing her thing, and she's definitely been an advocate for Willows, and we definitely appreciate that. But she also does her thing with Rhino, um, and so we definitely appreciate the work you're doing there. Uh, she is the winner of the Willow Books Literature Award for Poetry. Uh, her uh, work appears in Cinema Review, Colorado View, among many others. Born in Brooklyn and raised in Manila, she currently resides in Chicago, where she teaches poetry, workshops, and serves as senior poetry editor for Rhino. Please welcome Angela. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me tonight, and thank you for, for being here, all of you, on this rainy night. I am just so humbled and so grateful to be reading with my Willow family tonight. Oh my goodness, I mean, it's a tough act to follow, for sure. Um, can I lower this mic a little bit? Can you all hear me at the back? Should I come closer to the mic, maybe? Is that good? Tilted down. Oh, good idea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Heather and Randall, for all you do. Uh, to represent poets like us who are trying to make it in a world that normally does not represent us in the usual uh, places and for always um, just pushing for the work of, of diverse and divergent and emerging voices the way you do in so many ways. Um, and thank you for Gamut Gallery for having us in this beautiful space. It's, it's just a pleasure to be here. So I'd like to read a few poems from Blood Orange, my first book. Um, I, I don't think I've told this story before, but um, when I was called to, uh, when I was informed that I was a finalist for this prize, I had just returned from the, a manuscript conference, and one of the editors there said, you might as well forget about that manuscript because, you know, it's not going to make it in my press. Don't send it to me. Send it somewhere else, but not to me. And I was, like, ready to throw the towel in. And another editor in the conference said, no, keep that. Put it in a drawer. Keep submitting it and write your second book. But it, it's a book. It will see the light of day. 
But I, I literally almost threw the towel in on this book. And then I got to the airport, and I got an email from Heather saying it was a finalist. And thank goodness, I mean, that was like the voice of God for me, like just keep, you know, keep going. So, yeah, I learned through, through this experience never to give up and do the work that you believe in. And hearing all of you tonight write about what you feel most passionate about and what, you, what means most to you, that's really all that matters. Write what means the most to you and write from the heart. And, I, and that's what I hear when I, when I hear my fe fellow um, classmates reading tonight is that they all write from what, what matters the most in their own unique and diverse music and voices. And I'm just so proud to be part of this community. So thank you. Um, I'd like to start with a poem about my mother. She lives in the Philippines where I grew up. And um, hi, oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, this is so great. You're here. Yeah. My <laughs> Evelina Gala. Yeah, a fellow Filipina writer who I admire very much. Um, yeah. Uh, my mother uh, lives in the Philippines, and I try to visit her every year. She's currently struggling with dementia. And I wrote this poem as a poem of departure, because obviously there have been a lot of arrivals and departures between us. And departures are becoming increasingly hard now for, for both of us. It's a poem called Lucky. My mother looks for signs on the morning of my departure. Everything means something else, she assures me, when I topple a juice glass, calling it good fortune when crystal shatters. When I lose the coral earrings she gave me, she blesses heaven. Get her that, then you like. So when she hears the flight's been delayed, burnt a fuse, she's exultant. Convinced the gods have foiled some evil design on my safety. It delights her when I call her from the gate to say I've spilled coffee on my favorite sweater. And yes, the weather in Denver is fine. Mother of contradictions, believer in science and angels, for you I'd stoop to the wayward pin. Avoid each sidewalk crack. Comb a field of wild clover to find you a bomb for letting go. Uh, a poet once said that in poems, small things can bear the weight of anything. And I think we certainly heard that tonight. This is a small poem called Soap. Years later, my father would tell her that while she was away visiting family overseas, the slowly shrinking soap became a sacrament of his loneliness. And how, when he bathed on the eve of my mother's return, the bar had thinned to a petal on the lip of the tongue. Um, I recently read in San Francisco State University, and, and I realized the importance of naming, how important naming is uh, uh, for us as writers and just as people with memories, people, especially when we've left our homelands, um, naming is a way of claiming our histories, our past, the land that we grew up in. And um, so after I read this poem, which is about a fruit that I used to eat as a, a kid in my grandmother's house, um, this boy came up to me. He must have been about 21. And he said, I'm so glad you read that because now I know the name of that fruit that I've been trying to remember <laughs> for all the, the past three, two decades since I left the Philippines. So this is a poem called Aratiles. It's a wild berry that grows in the Philippines. Aratiles. Little red moons, fragrant marbles pocketed, softening against my skin. In the sharp grass behind grandmother's house, neighbor boys waited to grab their rubies for my skirt. Thrives in poor soil, not to be found in markets. Children thieve the berries from low-growing trees in backyards or sidewalks, leave nothing to the birds. In English, Jamaican cherry, Panama berry, in Malaysian, cherry kampung, meaning village cherry, in Spanish, kakaniqua, bolaina yamanaza, yuguito, menizo, capulin. How names mean nothing until you grow them on your tongue, burst the juicy pulp against your palate. Once in Mexico, I glimpsed a basket full from the window of a taxi. Aratiles. You can't say it without hearing rain on the roof of your mouth, rain rattling the panes of an empty house. On a boardwalk, 
a whiff of cotton candy on salt air brings back the grit of a hundred yellow seeds. Um, I'd like to end with a, a new poem that I'm writing uh, in a series about my mother's affliction. Um, I've been thinking a lot about memory and forgetting, and I, I, I was fortunate enough to visit her last June in the Philippines. And um, I realized that, you know, now that we are we're finding less and less um, thing, uh, connection through language, that music has been a, a way of connecting with her. And so I wrote this, this poem. What I learned this week. There are no more fireflies in northern Indiana. Marine life in Lake Erie is dying out because fish are ingesting plastic microbeads used in cosmetics to exfoliate dead skin. Yellow X's mark seven trees on our street that workers will ax next week. Ash borers have eaten them alive so they cannot absorb water or light. This week I learned that my mother is losing dexterity in both hands. But when I play box Ave Maria on the piano, she lifts her head, motions me to move her wheelchair closer. She leans over the keyboard to try the melody, finding the right notes each time. Her fingers can barely strike the keys, but I hear them. Some say music memory is the last to go. Still, I have no windfalls for the empty baskets of my mother's eyes. When I returned from Manila, the, peon the peonies I'd left in half blossom were stunted by summer storms. A bud that will not bloom is called a bullet. Thank you. All right, one more time for Angie. So I was trying to figure to who I want to end on, but I think I'm going to go with Patrick and then Curtis. <laughs> it's kind of up in the air. <laughs> anyway, but uh, our, next, our next reader will be Cer Cedric Tillman. His book is The Lilies in the Valley. Um, Cedric is, um, you know, is from Anson County, North Carolina, and was raised in Charlotte. He's a graduate of UNCC and the American University's Creative Writing MFA program, a Kavi Khanum fellow. Uh, his poems appeared in several, has appeared in several publications. Uh, he lives in Charlotte with his family, and I just want to say Cedric is one of those authors, too, that sort of works really hard, and we're definitely proud to have him as part of the Willis family, and we thank him for everything that he does. Come on up, man. Uh, thank you, Heather, for um, allowing these poems to be out in the world. And um, Angela and I were talking today about how we um, it's all get along and we love being around each other in the rare occasions that we are around each other. So thank you. Um, this first poem is called First, my first poem is "Hell Is You Doing?" Okay. Um, <laughs> this poem is called uh, "Everything Is New." Everything is new. The city went ahead and sloped off the property line, moved up the shed. Daddy, you love it. The new grass and all. Your footprints are all over the yard, all over each other like links in the fence. I can see you pruning the big ferns. Those new little oak trees twining their way into the aluminum. Not quite 8 a.m. on a Saturday, and I can't believe you were across town waking us with a saw like this is your house. Kia took a picture of you, hands on your hips, watching me cut my own grass for the first time. She was all big. The baby came a month after you passed. I guess you know all this. The city must have put something down for the mosquitoes. The Herndon say they used to put something down every year not nearly as bad as last summer. 
had some people come trim the trees hanging over the aging people's driveway, went and got me a blower. Every nine days or so, the grass gets up, but I don't get out there to the weekends. You finally got around to that new computer and didn't have it but a week. How much time that old damn thing took from us all. It had to be you. All these idle people running around. All these extras. Thin air for Trayvon. One, it's probably better to run so there's someone left to tell outside of the stories. But I like to imagine that I am brave, that I'll opt for the fight if I am ever contentedly minding my own business. Then hounded suddenly by a man who is decent enough most days, anonymously regressing through life toward the mean with treacherous designs on significance. Two, a couple rows back, a little girl says, Mommy, I'm scared the hundredth time. I'm scared, Mommy. Mommy, I'm scared, but of course we are all scared, baby. Though I would prefer your fears. I do envy how your reasons to be afraid get to differ from mine. I am scared of death, certain deaths, mostly a sudden falling towards earth, a violent loss of altitude and no turbulence on my journey through this tense, persistent air, a fear of descent because young men I know collapse into complicit skies every day, and I fear I am too much like them, that I won't get to see much before I land. Three, everything is noticed, if not inquired after. Everyone is touched as we brush past the wind in a hurry for impact. The blood is thick with conspiracy and everyone knows but not everyone can feel, so some people don't notice the virtue leaving. Some people say what left wasn't virtue. Four, I live in America and I tell my son the street lights mean I don't mean to see his mother flailing her arms beyond the embrace of ushers charged with keeping this much of us out of the casket. Five, the black president pronounces it Trayvon. The name is off the tongue quicker, the sound dies away faster. But it's probably not another failed attempt at establishing his American bona fides. It's just the way he talks. Six, we need to get to the bottom of it, have a full and thorough investigation. We have a criminal justice system for a reason and I hope justice is served. It's in everyone's best interest that this be dealt with in a timely fashion so the public can rest assured that law enforcement will palaver the et cetera, ensuring that we can so on and so forth. Um, so, two new poems. <coughs> um, so, uh, this poem, the epigraph of this poem is a Bible verse. Um, so uh, in the book of Mark, and this is described in one of the other gospels too, but Jesus is in the garden of uh, Gethsem Gethsemane, sorry. And um, he says, um, he tells the disciples two things. One, he says, uh, well, first he, he's praying to God and he says, I know you can, I, I wish that you would pass this cup for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And then he then goes to the disciples and say, says, uh, pray that you be not tempted. And that's the epigraph, Mark 14, 36 through 38. A couple other things that I was thinking about as I was writing this and I see it ca came out in this poem. Um, I don't know if anyone saw a story that came out a few years ago, uh, ago about an adultery gene. Um, and um, so it brought to mind to me uh, the extent to which behaviors are uh, you know, biologically determined as opposed to an, an environment and everything. Uh, and so people with this particular variation of this gene were 50% more likely to have cheated on their partners. Uh, it was a study by SUNY Binghamton. Um, and then um, there's this other sto uh, article about um, men, uh, testosterone levels dropping in men when they have babies. And the scientists speculating that Perhaps it was nature trying to uh, make men uh, be responsible, you know, and <laughs> and actually, but they literally measured these drops. So all this stuff is circling. Um. <laughs> so, and finally, uh, I was having a discussion about marriage on my page, and um, Adrian, my uh, press mate, said, I can't wait to see the poem that comes out of this, um, this discussion. So this is the poem. 
everything was together, but it just wasn't formed like it is, and that discussion brought it together, so. Not my will. There's an adultery gene out now, but she won't buy it. She's anti-science. <laughs> Act up and I can get the hell on, me and all my hormones. <laughs> I'm Mr. Family Man on the computer. You can tell when I talk I'm in church and not just at Easter. But I've known what I am ever since fourth grade, that summer in the apartments when my white girl found out about my black girl. <laughs> Made me choose while Where Do Broken Hearts Go played from a balcony across the street like theme music. <laughs> there was always the urge, even after the extra mouth to feed. Someone beautiful who needed me to be happy the way things were didn't change things. Because you're always an addict, it's true. But I want to hold up a family portrait like a black fist from the lonely soapbox on my doorstep in honor of our masquerades for how they are unlike so many truths we tell. And let the revolution be a liniment for bad memories, an asylum against fantasy. <laughs> um, so, Tupac, ever since I met you, I could peep depression. Sherelle and Alexander O'Neill, Saturday Love. It's been a long time. I didn't think I was ever going to see you again. See, you haven't changed. It's good to see you anyway. We talked at the beginning of that song. I love it. <laughs> I just noticed that the other day. So she's writing this. This is called Little Friends. A couple people heard it. Kiss me like Josephine Baker. Mwah. Hug me like it's been so long. You know I ain't mess with you because of your friends. Wouldn't have caught you. Wouldn't have you caught slumming. No, you hood, because you said, I look the same. And I said, you look the same. And I said, it don't crack, do it. And you said, OK. <laughs> That's that thing right there. Would love to take you somewhere. We could be ignorant as hell. Make jokes out loud. You just supposed to text or email. Mes <laughs> message, but not post on Facebook. Send you back to your little friends, your little fancy friends that work for nonprofits and foundations and colleges <laughs> and shit. I, I can talk fancy too now. Man, I can use terms like microaggression and heterosexist <laughs> and <laughs> in sentences for you, but I'm country. I'm bound to slip that Bogalusa, Opelaka, Anson County in. Liable to be where the Baptist church and the fat back at. Come ride your fine ass out for a moment, just me and you. Your dissertation committee ain't got to know you like Boosie. Come be whoever you was before you came up here for like five minutes. Get this done so I can send you back before they get wind that you AWOL over there where they waiting for me to be who they think I am, your little friends. the man who knows about microaggressions one more time, ladies and gentlemen. I'm saying. <laughs> Woo. I love this job. <laughs> anyway. Thank you, Cedric, <laughs> for the education. Anyway. <laughs> So you see what I'm saying? I love this. I love being part of these people, man. These people are just, they bring me so much joy in terms of what they write about, what they do, their thinking, and the way things just sort of happen. I mean, I, I just love it. Um, and so it's, it's so it's fitting, very fitting, actually, that we end on, um, you know, our next poet, Curtis Chrysler. Uh, Curtis and I, I met Curtis uh, when I, we were at Kavi Khanum retreat. Uh, we were both Kavi Khanum fellows. So I've been knowing I've been knowing him since I've been on this. We've been on this journey for a long time, and um, he was one of the first people that actually um, actually gave Willow Books a chance and allowed us to publish his work um, after he had. I think he had Tough Horse and Mountains, right? Yeah. And so he's like, you know, and so for him, for us, for with with him, and it's, it was definitely you know a thing where we respected his work and we wanted him on our press, and so we thank Curtis. You know, for all he's done, um, because if it wasn't for those first few people, those that allowed for us to publish the book, we wouldn't be here now. So thank you, man. Basically, one of my good friends. Come on up, bro. <laughs> Thanks, 
<laughs> all I can say is this so good to be here with you all. And Heather and Randall, as always, got your back. Because you have mine. So, I couldn't make it last night. I had to teach some kids <laughs> some stuff about poetry and stuff. So, I missed the Prince thing. So, I, um, well, see, that didn't do it. Not, you know, you know. So, I'm going to read my Prince poem. That's all I'm saying. I'm just going to read my Prince poem. Okay, uh, it's called Ordinarily. And it comes from, uh, I realized Prince Michael Jackson and Madonna were all born in 1958. And there's a from this persona poem about ordinarily. I craved to pull more leg into daddy's garage. So I claimed free food. Started my vexing falsetto like a banshee, which made mama top off screaming like a banshee. Me on strange stage and little dark draws like the little black draws that looked like panties mama sometimes wore to make daddy's love do handstands. Now I own mama's reaction. Counter daddy's with my little yellow ass slipped into high heels for higher scales. Embodied, there must be reason for this. I've always felt noble in hard times. And I know, I felt like Paul when Jesus said that three's a magic number. So I practiced three, three hours a day. Purple on my side, on my mind, turned life purple. When I knew mama loved tangerine, not purple. When I knew daddy loved teal, not purple. Which ordinarily subdued my chords. But I was indifferent, indifference, freedom, a guitar lick, drum solo, a kiss on condoms, a funked up treble clef odd town, cross wired like needles. Um, in writing this chapbook about Stevie Wonder, I always connect Stevie with love, and this one was one where Stevie kind of gets mad. And um, it's Stevie Boycotts Florida. Florida, uh, 2013, and this is over the whole Trayvon Martin thing. Mr. Mister, let me be. Let my horn to clap a neck speak up and bend sound circling. Let my voice jump bombastic from R&B and rock and roll to galactic. Let my Grammys, my lifetimes, my number ones gather dust if I can't ripple the raw. Mister, mister, let me be. Let the ten fingers of Lula Mae's baby play this horn of clavinet sideways. Let Sarita and Springsteen and Elton and Chaka hold me conscious. Let the UK, the US, the DR, and the new South Africa reverberate in the spasms of chords I lay down for baby justice. Mister, let me be. Let my chromatic harp hum the effervescent hum snapping the spine of AIDS. Let MLK's birthday, that's what friends are for, and Trayvon Martin stop moaning. Let me be the father blowing his breath into the instrument of life. Else, kill Lula Mae's boy now. Sir, I'm this close. You don't understand. I got speared in the forehead and beat death down to raw. I swear on Lula May and my children and Mandela and the word movement, if you don't want to throw down with the blind brother from the past, present, and future, one you can never see coming, just throw your hands up. Please throw your hands up. And I'll end with, uh, if I can find it, uh, this is a ekrastic poem that I wrote based on two things. It was based on a picture that my uncle drew, and it was a uh, this black woman with these very vibrant eyes. It's, you know how when they say picture like this dude checking me out, I was like, "Do what you're doing, man. Why are you looking at me?" <laughs> you know. Um, so you know how how how. <laughs> 
looking at me. But um, it's how the eyes, you know, just kind of penetrate to through your soul. So it's based on those eyes and somebody else's eyes that I I kind of knew. And it's called uh, the Emerald and Jade Eyes. You are gut music in the slave song, the comfortable stretch of day, the length and pause to night, brown stone cold chocolate Hershey mama, deep, rich, liptastic throwdown, a missed poem, pain to my groin, polymus funky freak of the week, sucky honey pop drop beast, snug ring around my finger. Not just love. It's your heartaches, cramps, doubts, your murmurs, sighs, and moans. You are the water wet with raindrop passion, a naked body full of thought, the belly's mind deeply noted in growth. You sparkle, sparkle lady saxophone, brown-eyed daughter of Isis, hot touch finger soother. You are backbeat bass line in my head's rhythm, brisk wind that moves blood to erect life. Who? <laughs> Talk about crazy. <laughs> now why are you gonna do me like that, bro? I don't even know I can get back in that poem. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll, I'll try to finish it. Okay. You are backbeat bass line in my head's rhythm. Brisk wind that moves blood to erect life. Cool perfumed ambrosia of thirst. Let's be one house in our home. Let's make a home for our dream. Two moons circling my solar plexus. Mother of midnight's laughter, joy of ecstasy's nucleus. Flashing blue light thundering outside my window. In darkness, you are my general electric. You hold me pure to many sanities. You are the cherry dark flower stem budding. The stretching sound in a geranium's neck. The slight motion of a boat in still water. I want your slices like cake sustenance and tomorrows. I am his spit, you are Coltrane's reed, the first note before a song begins, the melody and the bars of the mind. You are crackhead, jonesing for celestial pipe, the fire that sizzles the neck, inhaled <laughs> frenzy, exhale <sighs> love. You the suck of bulbous bottom lip, many words without an origin, my first breath to this verb. Good thing we folks, right? <laughs> But anyway, we want to uh, <laughs> we want to thank all of the Willow Book authors and supporters of Willow Books and friends and, and and everybody who came here tonight. So give yourselves and give the authors a round of applause. Um, you know, one of the people who sort of go silently unsung a lot of times um, is Heather Buchanan. She's in the back. She does everything. When I say everything, I mean everything. <laughs> so give, you know, definitely want to thank her. And so, you know, lastly, um, there are some books back there. And please, you know, we brought a few of them in here. Let us leave a little lighter <laughs> as you go about your night. <laughs> and thank everybody. And so fellowship, we got until 12 o'clock. So I, I think we got until 12, right? Is it 12? So let's fellowship for a little bit. Let's talk. Let's kick it. Thank you guys for coming once again. Thank you.